I'm sorry to have to tell you that today the number of deaths recorded from COVID in the UK has surpassed 100,000. And it's hard to compute the sorrow contained in that grim statistic. The years of life lost, the family gatherings not attended, and for so many relatives, the missed chance even to say goodbye. I offer my deepest condolences to everyone who's lost a loved one. Fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and the many grandparents who've been taken. And to all those who grieve, we make this pledge that when we've come through this crisis, we will come together as a nation to remember everyone we lost and to honour the selfless heroism of all those on the front line who gave their lives to save others. We will remember the courage of countless working people, not just our amazing NHS and care workers, but shop workers, transport staff, pharmacists, teachers, police, armed forces, emergency services, and many others who kept our country going during our biggest crisis since the Second World War. We will commemorate the small acts of kindness, the spirit of volunteering, and the daily sacrifice of millions who placed their lives on hold time and again as we fought each new wave of the virus, buying time for our brilliant scientists to come to our aid. In that moment of commemoration, we will celebrate the genius and perseverance of those who discovered the vaccines and the immense national effort never seen before in our history, which is now underway to distribute them, one that has now seen us immunise over 6.8 million people across the United Kingdom. And when those vaccines have finally freed us from this virus and put us on a path to recovery, we will make sure we learn the lessons and reflect and prepare. And until that time, the best and most important thing we can all do to honour the memory of those who have died is to work together with ever greater resolve to defeat this disease. And that is what we will do. I'm now going to hand over to Chris for the slides. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, on this very sad day, I've just got three uh, slides. Uh, the first um, is the number of people testing positive for COVID in the UK. Uh, and as you can see on this graph, the number peaked at an extremely high number. It is still at a very high number, but it has been coming down. Uh, I want to just uh, put one caution on that, which is that Office for National Statistics data uh, demonstrates a rather slower decrease and I think we need to be careful that we do not relax too early. Next slide, please. The number of people in hospital with COVID uh, is uh, still an incredibly high number, over 35,000 people. And as you can see in this graph, it is flattened off. It is not still rising overall. It is substantially above the peak in April. Uh, and uh, over this time, uh, it looks as if it's coming down very slightly in some areas, including London uh, and the southeast and the east of England, but there are some areas of the country where, that, where it is still not convincingly reducing. So it is still at a very high level throughout the country, and NHS staff are working incredibly hard with many very sick COVID patients. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, uh, on this day, uh, the uh, number of deaths uh, at the moment, uh, this looks as if this has flattened out, but at a very high level. So the most recent seven-day average for deaths, the rolling seven-day average, uh, is uh, 1,242 deaths, uh, an incredibly high number. And I think we have to be realistic that the, the rate of mortality, the number of people dying a day, will come down relatively slowly over the next uh, two weeks. Uh, and uh, will probably be flat for a while uh, now. So we will still, unfortunately, be having additional deaths to add to that very sad total that the Prime Minister talked about. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Is there anything you want to add? Well, I think really just to thank my fellow staff across the Health Service for everything that you have done over the course of the last year. 
this Sunday, it'll be a year since the first two patients with coronavirus were treated in hospital in Newcastle, and it'll be a year since the first flight returned from Wuhan to Arrow Park Hospital for quarantining of people returning to this country. And it's a year in which over a quarter of a million severely ill coronavirus patients have been looked after in hospital. And those staff who've been looking after those patients also, of course, experience what this pandemic has meant as daughters and as sons and as parents and as grandchildren with family and friends and neighbours. And so this is not a year that anybody is going to want to remember, but nor is it a year that across the health service any of us will ever forget. Thanks very much, Simon. Let's go to questions from the public now. Uh, Martin from the, from the Wirral. With vaccines well on the way, what are long-term plans to allow a return to travel and government working proactively with other nations to install safe travel mechanisms, including potential shared databases and any technology so we can get business growing as soon as possible? Thanks, Martin. Well, what we want to do is look at where, where we've got to on the 15th of February. As you know, that's the date by which we hope to have vaccinated all the uh, most vulnerable groups, the, the, uh, the, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, one to four uh, groups, uh, and, and see what, uh, where we are in terms of uh, reducing the, uh, the spread of infection and what we've done to protect the, the most vulnerable. Uh, I, I think, Martin, it'd be fair to say that, as, as you've heard from, uh, from Chris, uh, the, the rate of infection is, is still uh, pretty forbiddingly high, uh, but uh, at a certain stage we will want uh, to be getting things open, but uh, that will depend on us uh, continuing to succeed in uh, driving the level of uh, infection down and rolling out that vaccine programme as year fast as we possibly can. And what I will be doing in the course of uh, the next few days and, uh, and, and weeks is sending out in more detail as soon as we can uh, when and how we want to get things open again. But that will depend on us uh, continuing to beat the disease. Let's go to uh, Mark from Plymouth, please. Will the government expect to extend school closures until Easter? What strategy would the government publish to ensure no child is left behind? Mark, we will want to look very, very carefully at the data at where we've got to with the vaccination programme before we make our uh, announcements about the timetables. As I've just said to, uh, to Martin, we're working as hard as we can to, uh, to get things open. If you will recall, we, uh, we really wanted to keep schools uh, open and uh, I, we will want to reopen them. But we must do it in a way that is uh, safe and we must do it cautiously. Uh, I appreciate the huge efforts parents are now going to, uh, to teach their kids at, at home, to look after kids uh, who should be in school. A school is the best place for uh, pupils, and uh, uh, I, I know the, the, the educational damage that we risk uh, doing uh, by protracted lockdowns, and that's why the government continues to uh, support all sorts of measures to, uh, to help uh, teachers, uh, a big rollout of, of laptops, 1.3 million uh, laptops that we've uh, that we've uh, provided, and massive investments in uh, in catch up uh, tuition as well. Clearly, that can't be in, in tutoring and uh, one to one uh, help of all kinds. That can't be done uh, whilst kids are at home. So, uh, what we will do, Mark, is uh, work round the clock uh, as we come out of lockdown to ensure that the kids who have suffered, pupils who have suffered from loss of of learning, of, from differential learning uh, uh, across the country, get the attention, get the, uh, the, the, the tuition and the support that they need and, and will make sure that exams are fair uh, and properly adjusted to reflect what everybody has been going through in the last 12 months. Let's go to, uh, to Laura Koonsberg of the BBC. Uh, thank you very much. And everyone's thoughts tonight are with those who have lost loved ones, the families left behind. But, Prime Minister, near the start, the hope in government was to contain the numbers to 20,000. It's now five times that. What went so wrong? And to the others, can you give us any idea of the range 
of the possible totals that you are looking at now? What are your expectations? Well, Laura, I think on, on, on this day, I should just really repeat that I am deeply sorry for every uh, life that has been lost. And of course, as, as, uh, as Prime Minister, I take full responsibility for everything that the government uh, has done. What I can tell you is that uh, we truly did everything we could and continue to do everything that we can uh, to minimise loss of life and to minimise suffering in what has been a very, very difficult uh, stage uh, and a very, very difficult crisis for our country. And we will, uh, we will continue to do that, uh, just as every government that is affected uh, by this crisis around the world uh, is continuing uh, to do the same. I think in terms of the uh, range of totals, I've always been very careful not to try and make forward projections on terms of numbers. Uh, I, all I have said earlier on, and I will repeat this, is unfortunately we're going to see quite a lot more deaths over the next few weeks before the effects of the vaccines begin to be felt. And I think we have to be realistic that that is going to happen. Uh, but um, trying to actually put a number on that I don't think is helpful uh, to anybody. Uh, I think what we really should do is do everything we can to try and prevent that. And that is a combination of rolling out the vaccines, as the Prime Minister has said, but also all of us doing our bit in terms of uh, staying at home uh, except where we have to. And that's something which I know the entire uh, country is doing. And that is really the key to the next few weeks. Fundamentally, the driver of the death rate is the infection rate. Uh, set against that, we are seeing continuing improvements in hospital treatment for severely sick coronavirus patients. Uh, crudely, the uh, in-hospital uh, death rate has fallen from about a third to a fifth, and we do expect that there will be more treatments for coronavirus looking out over the next six to 18 months, perhaps. Um, we've already seen those with some of the corticosteroids, some of the rheumatoid arthritis drugs that have been repurposed. There are antivirals in the pipeline. So looking out, I think we can see a world in which coronavirus may be more treatable. But for right now, it's a combination of reducing infections and getting vaccinations done. And as we stand here this evening, one in eight adults across this country have now had their first vaccination. So we are well on our way. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Laura. Paul Brand of ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, 20,000 deaths was once described as a good outcome. How would you describe the outcome of 100,000 deaths that you've presided over? And to Professor Whitty, what would you say to care homes who are telling us tonight that they are concerned about the gap between the first dose of the vaccine and the second dose and who are calling on the government to close that gap back down to the recommended number by Pfizer? Paul, I, I think that uh, you know, you, you'd exhaust the thesaurus of, uh, of, of misery. There, it's an appalling and, and tragic loss of life and there's, there's no question about it. And uh, all we can do now, is, as Chris has just been saying, uh, and is work together uh, with the with the the tools that we have of uh, of the of the stay at home uh, principle plus the vaccines uh, to to defeat the virus and I'm uh, as I say I'm sure that we will. Uh, in terms of the gap, um, I'm going to give a relatively technical answer because I think this is important that people uh, who are listening to this, you've had one vaccination. Uh, actually uh, understand the, the logic behind it, because I think this is a, a key, key question. The first and really critical point, uh, which I think everybody understands, is our limitation is the number of vaccines available. That's true here, it's true in every other country as well. So therefore, by definition, if you give a vaccine twice to someone, uh, you can only give it to half the number of people over a period of time. So the reason, the first reason for delaying the course of the uh, vaccines uh, is to double over the next uh, few weeks uh, the number of people who can actually have a vaccine uh, and get some protection. The second point on this is the great majority of the protection comes from the first vaccine that someone has, the great majority. And that's true for the Pfizer vaccine. It's true for, as far as we can see, the Moderna vaccine, which is coming. And it's true for the AZ vaccine. So the great majority of this protection is from that first dose. And by therefore, uh, what we're doing is we're giving a first dose to twice as many people. 
Now, the third thing people say is, well, might we have a situation where the immunity suddenly wanes between uh, three weeks and 12 weeks? And there is no evidence for that for natural immunity. There is no evidence for that for the AZ vaccine. And there is no evidence for that in the Moderna vaccine, which is very similar, it's another RNA one, to the, uh, to the Pfizer vaccine. So that side of things, I think we are confident of. Uh, uh, the final uh, reason that people are worried about is, well, could this uh, give rise to a situation where there's an increased risk uh, of something uh, developing uh, in terms of a, a variant of this in the period of the eight weeks, and that's a theoretical worry. But there may be data, there certainly is data from AZ to imply we may get at least as strong a response, and for AZ at least, possibly even a stronger response for having the longer period of time, which means that will be a stronger period and for a longer period of protection afterwards, which will uh, help protect the vaccine as well as the individual person afterwards. So there's lots of reasons why we think, uh, you know, we've, we've thought very carefully about what the balance of this is, but the balance of risk in terms of reducing the number of deaths in the community, and I really want to stress that, that is the aim of this, is to maximise the number of people who get that first dose where the great majority of the protection comes from. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Sam Coates, Sky. Prime Minister, you just said we truly did everything we could to save lives. Do you really not reflect on whether some of those 100,000 deaths could have been prevented if you'd made decisions differently and perhaps followed scientists' recommendations more closely? Professor Whitty, do you wish you could have done more to encourage a lockdown or circuit break, as Sage suggested, in September rather than having to wait till the end of October? And Sir Simon, do you think that there was too much household mixing in December? Sam, I just want to repeat what I, I said really to, uh, to, to Paul and to, and, to, and to Laura. We did everything that we could uh, to minimise suffering and minimise loss of life in this country as a result of the pandemic. And I'm deeply sorry for every, uh, every, every, lo every life lost. Um, uh, what I can say is that the government will continue uh, to do everything we can to minimise life lost as, as we go forward. And, uh, and uh, I, I continue to urge people, as, as, as Chris has just done, uh, to uh, follow that guidance and uh, stay at home and protect the NHS and save lives. Uh, in terms of the question you asked me, I mean, the, the, the data, uh, you know, the, we, what we have now is a situation which is quite different to what we had in September. And I think it's important that we recognise that. The new variant has changed the situation we're in very substantially. The question about when to actually do particular measures has always been a matter of trying to balance, and I've said this repeatedly throughout this uh, tragic um, uh, pandemic, balance the things which actually reduce the risk of transmission with all the other things we're trying to do in terms of society uh, staying uh, functioning over what has been a very long period of time and unfortunately not one we're not through at the moment and that's something which uh, political leaders have had to balance really difficult things the scientific evidence is clearly something which is, is one part of that and something which people have tried to make as clear as possible and all the minutes are published and that's all very it's extremely clear what the evidence on that is but i would go back to saying the thing which we have which has made things very different uh, in 2021 has been the problems of the new variant, and that was not predictable in September, uh, although that is something we are trying to do something uh, to address now. And, you know, that's the reason... We were worried two weeks ago that the measures we had at the moment were not enough to hold this new variant. I think what the data I showed you at the beginning of the slide sessions shows is that the rates are just about holding with the new variant with what everybody is doing. Our big worry uh, it was that, that we didn't even be able to hold it, it's going to be much harder because it's new variant, and I think we have to be realistic about that. Um, what I'd say, Sam, is three things. First of all, in terms of the underlying causes of spread, I think we defer to Chris and to the epidemiologists. But secondly, the facts as we see it in the health service are that on Christmas Day, we had 18,000 coronavirus positive patients, and now we've got just under 33,000. But the third point is that we've seen that growth rippling up from the southeast, London, to the east of England, and then up to the Midlands, which is consistent with the spread of the new variant of the virus. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, Pippa Krira, The Mirror. 
Hello. <clears throat> um, in the, Prime Minister, in the days and weeks approaching this sad milestone, have you spoken to the families bereaved by coronavirus? Do you ring them up privately or meet them on Zoom? And if you haven't, then why not? And if I could also ask you, um, NHS staff in Scotland were given £500 a bonus in recognition of their hard work during the pandemic. Even Lidl, the supermarket, has given its staff a £200 bonus today. Why haven't NHS staff in England had a similar um, gesture of support? And so, Simon, would you like to see them get one? Thank you. Um, well, Pippa, the answer to your first question is yes, of course, I've uh, talked to... Uh, families of the of, of the bereaved and will continue to do so. And again, I extend my I offer my my my, my condolences to everybody who suffered uh, a, a loss of a loved one during this pandemic. And uh, we do our absolute utmost to uh, support our wonderful NHS staff. And uh, have indeed, had uh, a a three year uh, pay package for for nurses as, uh, that I think was 12.8 percent. Uh, and will continue to invest record sums uh, in the NHS. I think the, 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 the amount we in, invested in the NHS even before the pandemic began uh, was uh, more than any time uh, in, in modern memory, a £34 billion package of investment, and that will continue under this government. I think what I would say is that having talked to many staff across the health service, obviously day in, day out, actually what people probably want right now is three things. First of all, to be able to look forward to some sort of respite from what has been just an incredibly uh, demanding um, and um, uh, continuous uh, year of pressure. Secondly, to know that uh, there are um, reinforcements on the way, that the staffing pressures in the health service will be taken seriously in the years to come. And there are some encouraging signs on that, but we've got to do a lot more. And then thirdly, to tackle the pressures in the here and now, which fundamentally are about reducing the number of new patients who are turning up in A&E severely ill with coronavirus day in, day out. So it's that combination, I think, a sense that there will be some respite, a sense that uh, the health service will get uh, resilient with the staffing support that it needs in the years to come. But for right now, that actually we collectively turn off the uh, incessant new admissions that are arriving with very severely ill coronavirus patients. Thanks, Pippa. Uh, Harry Cole, the son. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, our readers with children are desperate for some clarity. This is not a question of uh, when, but a question of how. Will children in lower case areas be allowed to go back to school first, especially primary school children who have the most to lose from this virus educationally? Will you phase back schools by age and region when it is possible to begin getting children back into the classroom? And if I may, there's been some sabre rattling and some uh, comments out, out of Europe looking at the possibility of blocking exports of vaccines produced into Europe to third countries like the UK. Can we get our uh, response from you to that? And what measures are you putting in place behind the scenes to make sure that our vaccine supplies are not uh, under threat from a hostile, uh, hostile action such as that? OK. Um, thanks, uh, Harry, very much. Uh, Getting kids back into school, primary kids back into school, as I said earlier, uh, that's something that uh, has been a top priority for the government, continues to be our top priority for any kind of, uh, of reopening. Clearly, uh, if we're going to go back uh, after half term, February the 22nd, we need to give two weeks notice. So what I can tell, uh, tell you, Harry, is we will be making sure that we give, uh, give uh, advice well in advance of that about what we uh, hope to do and, and give people some rough idea of uh, when, things might be, uh, when things might be possible. And that depends, as I've said earlier, on uh, the, uh, the rollout of the vaccine, where we are with the pandemic, the rates of infection, uh, and, and, and so on. And on your, your, your excellent point about uh, would there be a regional uh, difference when we look at areas where the um, uh, the virus is uh, is, is less uh, is, is less present it's a pretty much a national picture at the moment uh, but we, of course we will look at uh, all those types of uh, uh, all those all those ideas on uh, supply of vaccines from uh, abroad and supply into this country uh, I've got total confidence in our supplies. We've been over this many, many times in the last uh, few days and, and hours. We, we've got confidence in, in our supply. I've seen what uh, Commissioner Kiriakides has uh, said. Um, and all, all I would say is, obviously, uh, we uh, expect and, and hope that our EU uh, friends will honour uh, 
uh, all contracts, uh, and we will continue. Uh, we fully expect that that will happen, and we continue to uh, work with friends and partners in uh, in the EU and indeed around the world, uh, because the uh, delivery of the vaccine has been a, a, a multinational effort. The creation of the vaccine has been a multinational effort, and the and the delivery of, of the vaccine is multinational as well, because the, the virus knows no borders. I think that was. It. I don't think you had a question for 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 uh, either of uh, my colleagues. Let's go to finally to Charlie Cooper of Politico. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, it's it's a terrible milestone we've we've passed today, uh, Prime Minister. You spoke about learning lessons. Um, can you give a, a concrete example or, or several concrete examples of what you are doing or planning uh, to ensure that? We never see the terrible loss uh, of life in the UK again because this will not be the last pandemic. And just to, to follow up on the question about the, the EU, would you urge the EU against um, the kind of vaccine controls, uh, controls on, on exports of vaccines that have been suggested? So, so would I urge the EU to, to a, do what? Against, against, against them, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, so I wasn't yeah. quite sure of that. Uh, yeah, look, um, Charlie, thank you very much. On uh, what were doing let let's be in in no doubt that the uk is is in a radically different position now from where we were uh, 12 months ago uh, when it comes to pandemic preparedness or dealing with a, an epidemic of, of this kind we you know we we have uh, huge quantities of uh, not only huge quantities for instance of ppe uh, but we have the ability to make it uh, ourselves we've uh, we've created uh, a, a, a an indigenous uh, industry uh, to do lateral, to, not just to, uh, to conduct lateral flow testing, uh, but to make lateral flow tests. Uh, we have a vast test and trace uh, industry. NHS test and trace has been uh, built from, uh, from scratch, is now uh, a colossal operation uh, that is actually doing amazing work in isolating incidences of, of the disease and helping us uh, to uh, to find out exactly what is going on and where. The UK is also, uh, I'll ask Chris and Simon to comment on this, but the UK is also uh, uh, out in front in conducting genomic testing of the, uh, of the, of, of the virus uh, cases so that we, we know exactly what type of virus. And 47% of all the uh, genomic analysis in the world is now done in the, in the UK. Uh, you, you'll have seen what... Uh, th this country has done uh, in terms of uh, creation of the uh, viable treatments for uh, the, the virus uh, or, or pioneering uh, uh, viable treatments in the form of dexamethasone. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly we are, we are out in front in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the manufacture of uh, or the, the, the creation of or one of a group of countries that is uh, doing well in, in helping to create uh, vaccines. Uh, none of that is, of course, any consolation for the, uh, the, the terrible toll of life that we're uh, forced to announce today, that I'm forced to announce today. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that things are really uh, very different uh, now in the UK uh, as a result of the, of the pandemic and, and our, our, our readiness for any future pandemic is really uh, colossal by comparison, but that's probably a no particular surprise to you uh, or, or to our viewers. Uh, I think people would expect that, and, and quite rightly. Um, on on uh, your, your point about um, the vaccines and the, our friends in the EU, I, I would just repeat what I said. Uh, the creation of these vaccines has been a wonderful example of uh, multinational uh, cooperation, and I think that one of the lessons we have to learn uh, as a, uh, the world has to learn from the pandemic is the need to cooperate and uh, to make sure that we do things together and we understand how to fight these pandemics together. So I don't want to see restrictions on the supply of PPE across borders. I don't want to see restrictions on the supply of drugs uh, across borders. And I don't want to see restrictions on, the, uh, on vaccines or their, uh, or their ingredients across borders. And I, and I think that's uh, pretty commonsensical and uh, I'm sure uh, you know, would be widely supported across the EU as well. I, I just I, I, there's a huge amount we have learned, are learning, and will learn about this. Uh, to you know, I'll take just three broad groups. There's things we've learned scientifically. 
Uh, we now understand the virus in a way we didn't, and some of the science has undoubtedly changed. Some of our understanding of what the science meant has changed. For example, we were initially quite cautious about whether masks were useful. We decided that they were based on increasing uh, levels of evidence. Uh, we uh, initially didn't realize quite how strong the importance of um, asymptomatic uh, transmission was, for example. I think we now recognize that's a very major part of it. Then there's things we've, under we've learned clinically, and the reason, as Sir Simon said earlier on, that the death rates have gone down is doctors are learning the whole time. Some of this by randomized trials, like dex dexamethasone, a variety of other trials, many of which are led from the UK, because we have a very strong uh, tradition of evidence-based medicine, but also just by clinical practice, which is uh, the way that doctors and nurses learn uh, how to improve uh, treatment uh, in, in different areas. And we've learned things operationally. Very obviously, that means that we can do things now that we were not able to do and didn't understand how to do early on, uh, and we will continue to learn, and I think we need to realise we're going to have to continue to learn uh, the lessons from this pandemic, because there is a lot for us to learn from it. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, there on the day we mark 100,000 deaths.